Thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Seema Iyer, and I have the great privilege and honor of overseeing the University of Baltimore's undergraduate program in real estate and economic development. I would like to welcome all of our program alumni back. There's many of you in the room. Welcome. And we have over 40 students here matriculating in the real estate and economic development program. And the Lessons of Legend event is meant uh, to inspire them about what their career could be. And so we're very excited today to have Arnold Williams here to join us. To kick off uh, this evening, I want to turn it over to the Dean of the Merrick School of Business, uh, Murray Deal. Well, welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to, uh, you know, to see so many alumni come back and uh, particularly also to our special guest. Uh, we're, I know we're all really looking forward to this and uh, uh, our students and, and particularly also our board members. Uh, so I, I want to, uh, I want to particularly thank our, uh, uh, you know, our, our sponsors uh, tonight. They're they're circulating on the on the board behind me. But Atapco uh, Properties, Continental Realty Corporation, Crew Baltimore, M&T Bank, Maryland Center for Construction, Education, and Innovation, Enterprise, and McKenzie. So, uh, and so. Say it again. Sorry, this is my. My, the guy in front of me who's, when I forget my lines, is trying to tell me <laughs> something. So, uh, but I know Larissa is also going to expand on this, so I, 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 I appreciate that. You know, a, and this event is very important for, for the Merrick School and for, for, the, for the University of, of Baltimore. You know, there's, uh, we like to think that we're, we're, we're doing something special for the real estate program with the with the, the real estate and economic uh, development program. I mean, our, our, our students, as you know, are, are rather special. We're, we're very different in the state of Maryland because, you know, we are the number one university in Maryland for educating adults. You know, our, our average age of an undergraduate is 28. Uh, for our graduate students, 32. So, so and I think this gives a very special profile for, uh, for our students. We also are aspiring, and, and a number of the alumni who I've talked to tonight, you know, are, came in this path. We're trying to aspire to be, you know, the most transfer-friendly university in, a, in, in Baltimore, and I, I hope that applied to the experience that our alumni had who came, came in that path. But for this program in particular, it's is a, is a, is a prototype of the kind of program that, that, that we want. We want to have students and we want to have programs that are focused on careers and, and professionals. You know, that you come to Merrick School to become someone. You come to Merrick School to become a real estate professional or another type of professional. So, so this, this program really is really the archetype of of, of what we want in, uh, in, in the business school. And we try always to intersperse our, our academic le learning with practical on the ground learning. And that's why we also have these events because it complements what's in the classroom. So the students are here, you know, I always say to them in events like this, you may not get graded for this event, but you never know when you're gonna use the information you get from, from, from one of these events. So I'm looking forward to this. It's gonna be an exciting evening. And so thank you very much for coming. Thanks. Uh, my students are getting participation points. So <laughs> just to remind you. Um, yes, as the, as the Dean said, uh, we cannot uh, do what we do to make such a clear connection between what goes on inside the classroom with what goes on inside the industry without our phenomenal um, at, uh, advisory board. I'd like to recognize all of you that are here from the board, if you can raise your hands so that everybody acknowledges all of you. They are who we uh, affectionately refer to as the doers. Uh, this board does not allow me to get into any room without actually having something that we can accomplish. And this event is actually one uh, great example of how they show their real commitment um, to Baltimore's future leaders uh, in real estate and economic development. 
And at the helm of that board is uh, the fabulous Larissa Salamaka from the B Baltimore Development Corporation, who is currently our chair and a proud UB alum. And she's here to welcome you as well. Thank you, Seema. I want just a few minutes to thank our board, uh, a volunteer board made up of the following organizations. And if you bear with me, I'll make this quick. Uh, Whitford Taylor and Preston, m and Bank, Alex Brown Realty, McKenzie Commercial Real Estate, Remax Commercial Logic, St. John's Properties, David S. Brown Enterprises, The Whiting Turner Contracting Company, Adapco Properties, Continental Realty Corporation, Southway Builders, Hybrid Development Group, Enterprise Asset and Management Inc. and Partnerships, Maryland DHCD, Govins Ecumenical Development Corporation, the Maryland Center for Construction, Education, and Innovation, Baltimore Development Corporation, RITA, which is the student group here, and two associations that just joined last year. That's the Institute for Real Estate Management, IRAM, and CRU, the Commercial Real Estate Women. I want to thank all of these representatives that are on the board because they give up their time to be mentors for the students, to provide guidance for the program, and to help develop future programs for the school. Um, I wanted to make a point to the students that are here, the two associations that we have, IRAM and CRU, are here, and they have many opportunities that you really should seek out reps that are, that are here with those organizations because they are talking about internship internship opportunities, uh, offering membership in local chapters here in the Baltimore area to you as students and invitations to attend all their various events. There are scholarships that are also available, especially for women that would join crew and uh, providing all uh, opportunities for joining a variety of their committees and attending their events. So thank you again very much and very much appreciated all of the volunteer work that's done. So uh, events like this take a lot of time to put on, uh, and I want to thank the people that have uh, done that for us today. Tashi Jelani, who may not be here anymore, but literally we couldn't do this work without her, who serves us in the America School of Business. Um, Leslie Joyce from the UB Foundation, our student volunteers who you met, hopefully, Makita Thompson, Peter Coe, William Casey, and Ladisha Stratton. Thank you uh, for all of your help that you have done and you will be doing. Um, our board members really wanted to make sure that we took a moment right now to actually honor the students that are here uh, and being recognized for great achievements. So first I'd like to um, uh, actually announce uh, that nobody else knows the Reed students who have achieved high academic honors this um, academic year and, and have also exhibited exemplary standards as UB students. And I am very pleased to announce that this academic year's Merit School honors goes to two students, uh, Joshua Dinkins and uh, Chase Robinson. If you could uh, stand. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Chase and Josh. Um, so the other point that we want to recognize um, some of our students is a, a program that just started this year. As some of you may know, I actually wear two hats here at the University of Baltimore. Uh, in addition to academically serving as the Reed Director, I oversee a research project here called the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. Anybody heard of it? Uh, so we prepare what's called the Vital Science Report for the um, Baltimore neighborhoods, which are basically a compendium of over 100 quality of life indicators for all of our community changes. And for the last two, uh, you know, eight years that I've been doing both of these things, I have a pretty unique vantage point um, for about Baltimore. The vital signs are effectively market indicators that many real estate uh, professionals use to better understand, you know, the real estate and economic development in all of our neighborhoods. I've been working with all kinds of community-based um, organizations to understand how these market data can impact their ability to attract developers. Um, in my unique perch, let me tell you that every community in Baltimore wants development. They just want it in a way where they are a true equitable partner in what that vision can be. So with these two hats that I was wearing, um, I'm seeing students in the classroom and our Reed students 
who are aspiring to become those kinds of developers and want them to get involved. I found a partnership, luckily, with uh, the Baltimore Community Lending. I think we had uh, a common, common spirit. I want to recognize uh, Bill Ariano, who's president of BCL, somewhere back there. Thank you, Bill, for being here. Uh, and the BCL board members who are here as well, a lending institution interested in making those better matches between developers and community with the capital that they have to provide. So I am very excited to present to all of you our very first cohort of the Real Estate Fellowship and Venture Capital with support from our Reed board, BCL, M&T Bank, PNC Bank. We chose eight fellows, eight students and alum. These are not just Reed students, these are actually from the broader UB community who are going through an intensive professional mentoring program right now. They will be pulling together a development plan in the form of a pitch competition and the winning pitch will engage with BCL uh, for up to a $1 million guidance line of credit. So uh, I want to introduce you to the eight fellows. If you could please stand. Um, Tiffany Green, Nikolay Ratajic, Leslie Wynn, Jenna Holmes, Hayden Wyatt, Alashegun Ajay, David Faraz, and William Casey. These fellows will be making their pitch on June 5th. Uh, will you, hear, you will all hear much more about that closer to the day. And now, uh, let us move to the program you are all here for today. I want to welcome our board member, Josh Neiman, to introduce this year's legend. Thanks, Seema. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight to our Lessons from Legends celebration. As Seema said, my name is Josh Neiman, and I'm the owner of Hybrid Development Group, a small real estate development consulting firm based here in Baltimore. I've also been on the Reed board for more years than I can count. Um, I have this distinct pleasure tonight of introducing our honoree, Arnold Williams. I'd like to direct your attention to the program so you can read Arnold's bio and about his many accomplishments. What I'd like to share are some personal thoughts. I have been working in the real estate world in Baltimore for nearly 25 years. And all along, Arnold has been there to influence and shape the landscape of the city that he has called home for his entire life. My first encounters with Arnold came when he was chairman of the board at the Baltimore Development Corporation. He and I then began to serve on the Baltimore City Markets Corporation board Arnold is one of those forces as nature, as his wife will surely attest, who has endless amounts of energy to volunteer on, to make Baltimore and Maryland a better place for us all. But I really got to know Arnold in the last year. Bishop Dante Hickman, whom, from whom you will hear later, asked me to be a consultant on the Southern Streams Health and Wellness Center, a pivotal project in East Baltimore. What I didn't know at the time was that Arnold was not only a member of the church, but also Bishop Hickman's consigliere. Like Tom Hagen from The Godfather, Arnold doesn't need, nor does he want to be, center stage. He sits and intently listens and digests what takes place in every meeting. But when he does say something, his soft-spoken voice is always insightful and he steers the conversation to a resolution that works for everyone. Arnold personifies the concept of win-win. He is about improving the city for all of his residents, about making the proverbial pie bigger so that everyone can have a slice. We are also honored to have with us tonight President Kurt Schmoke, who is going to interview Arnold in just a few moments. President Schmoke like Arnold, is a tireless champion of Baltimore. A star quarterback at City College, he went on to be a prosecutor, the city's first elected African-American state's attorney, the city's first elected African-American mayor, the dean of Howard Law, and now the president of UB. He also had the distinction of appointing Arnold to the board of BDC. When I bumped into President Schmoke at an event this past fall 
and asked if he would interview Arnold tonight, he didn't even look at his calendar and said yes immediately. So I'm honored to welcome President Schmoke and Arnold Williams, the Lessons from Legend honoree this year, to the stage. You. That goes to Virgie then. <laughs> we'll put it in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Where would you like to sit? Why don't you take to the seat? Okay, thank you. Great. Super. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. It's great to see you all here. I uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Arnold, for allowing us to say all these nice things about you in, fr <laughs> in front of your wife. <laughs> it's great. We um, uh, have a few minutes here. We wanted to talk a little bit about some of the highlights in, in your uh, career, particularly uh, as it relates to uh, real estate issues and, and, and development. Uh, you've been involved in so many uh, uh, so many things, uh, both the private sector and uh, through your work at the uh, Baltimore Development Corporation, that intersection of the public sector and private sector. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, I know you got to start right. uh, first at the, at the community college, the sure. Baltimore City Community College, right. and we're very proud of that. And then, of course, your graduate of University right. of Baltimore. Uh, what drew you first, though, to accounting as a, as a profession? So, of course, I went to Baltimore City College, um, and, and, and I followed the year after um, who was then known as quarterback, Kurt Schmoke. <laughs> so there's a legend in his own mind. <laughs> and, and while I was at City taking bookkeeping and accounting courses, that was one of the courses where I had my highest grades. <laughs> So I basically said my um, college career would be in accounting. Something that I discovered later but did not remember is having participated in a, a church program very early, and it was almost like a, a, um, a, a program where it was asking young people what are your career goals? Mm. And when I look back at those ledgers, it said that my career goal would be to become a certified public accountant. What you have to understand is I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> my family had no money. We, we did not know about banks, did not know about accounting, but there was something that said, I wanted to be a certified public accountant. And then the um, Baltimore City College gave me some of that groundwork. Mm -hmm. That program was prior to going to Baltimore City College. Mm -hmm. And then once I went to um, Bal um, Baltimore City Community College, I really um, learned that that was the career for me. Mm -hmm. It was not until I um, attended University of Baltimore that I really knew it was the career for me. And University of Baltimore at the time had um, great instructors who were also in practice. Right. And I, I never forget that one of my instructors also was the chair of the Maryland State Board of Accountancy. And sitting in his class, I felt that I could be a chair of the Maryland State Board of Accountancy. Right, right. And eventually did that. Yeah, absolutely. So when you, fin when you graduated, though, and you, then you had to take the CPA exam? Correct. And uh, after uh, becoming a, a CPA, 
Did you uh, start your own firm or did you go work for someone else? Okay. How did that uh, progress? While um, attending college, I worked at John Hopkins Hospital okay. in the medical records um, division. And once I graduated, moved to their accounting department and felt at a given time that it was not as challenging mm -hmm. as I needed it to be. So I left there and went to a hospital auditing company. And from there, um, went to work for the Maryland General Assembly. Mm -hmm. and in the division of audits under, um, it, it was called the legislative auditors, right. and they gave me the healthcare circuit. And it was that job that encouraged me to move into private practice. And if I would, and if I would tell you what encouraged me, we were, so the office was an office of 90. And, and we never, all 90 were never in the office. We were all over the state of Maryland. But there was always a group at the state office building and they would collaborate at lunch. Mm -hmm. I never forget a payday where uh, we were less than 30 years old and and someone pulled out a paycheck and began to calculate their, their retirement pay. <laughs> Less than 30, already calculating retirement, and I basically says, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so what, in starting a firm though, that's a, that's a pretty big challenge, did you, what were, what were the uh, hurdles that you had to overcome, though, to actually start uh, that firm? So, so I was always of the opinion that I didn't need to start a firm to work in a firm. Ah. And, and I'm, I'm leaving the state of Maryland, and I began to search for firms that I could join Oh, I see. And, and, and so I decided to um, join a firm with an offer later for partnership. I see. And the partnership was offered to me within three years. And once I got there, um, in a year, I made partner. And th theoretically would be there today except for a little incident. And that incident made me say, um, we're gonna start a firm. Okay, I'm hooked. <laughs> <laughs> what was the incident? <laughs> so I, I just happened to have a cold. <laughs> and, um, and the day I had a cold, um, my then secretary was fired. Oh. And I was okay with the firing, but wanted to understand the incident that caused the firing. And when I um, approached the managing partner, the managing partner basically said, um, don't ask me any questions. And so I knew that I was a partner in name and, and, and just a, a little side story. So I made partner in a year. The second year of being a partner, they changed the name of the firm to add my name to it. In the third year, my secretary gets fired and I was basically told that, um, don't ask me questions. Right. And that was the day I began to plan um, starting a firm. Okay. Nice incident. <laughs> so at some point, the year, the CPA issue, uh, being an accountant, and then the real estate issues started to, to merge. Was that because of a particular client that you had, or was it an, an interest that you had in uh, real estate and it, development? It, it came out of volunteerism. 
Hmm. So when, um, right after graduating from college, um, immediately I began to volunteer. And there was an organization called Adopt a House. Right. Adopt a House was in the Cold Stream Homestead Montebella community. And it was a very small organization, but they were determined to redevelop the community. And the head of Adopt a House had a very um, um, distinct interest in developing young professionals. So around the volunteer board were uh, CPAs such as me, attorneys such as um, attorney Kurt Schmoke. <laughs> and, and so all of a sudden this organization had developed young professionals that they were showing how to redevelop communities. And this was a grassroots organization, um, buying one house at a time and developing it. And that just led to other volunteer positions, such as Baltimore Housing Partnership, where again, you learned a little more about development and it just went on and on. So from the Adopt-A-House, now know that uh, you also became, uh, uh, they refer to you as consigliere at, at Southern, I, some kind of way that doesn't quite fit, but, uh, but, but I know that you became a kind of counselor to a lot of churches that were doing work. Was that CPA work specifically or real estate development activity? It, it, so, so it started out being um, a, uh, an accountant, and just so that everybody understand the real story, I graduated from college at the same year that the um, church that I had attended moved to a new location. And I was asked at a very young age to, um, um, joined the board of trustees, which I declined. And, and so I was asked, if you won't join a board, will you at least help them um, with their accounting? So remember, I'm just coming out of school, know nothing about accounting, except what I've learned in the books. So I go to the office to find out, um, can you show me the records? Because they, they gave me one task, and that was to record the cost of the building on the books of the ministry. So I asked for the books of the ministry, and they proceeded to show me a box. And when I saw the box, I then, uh, when I became the partner in the first accounting firm, I basically developed an accounting system for faith-based organizations, basically saying that if they're going to represent the urban community, that they must do it in a business-like manner, not go to a bank with a box, but go to the bank with a financial statement. What what that then led to was one church after another asking for advice. Well, what most people in this room do not know is that is an economic engine. So most people believe that the church is only about religion and faith, but the church is also about economics. And it was very important to have that economic engine respected in the business community. And so I just 
took it on my own to make that happen. So as you talk about economics, that also means that if a, if a church is successful, they're going to expand. And it was the expansion of these institutions yeah. that then got me further into the real estate business. And, it, and, and when, you, when you get involved in real estate, it's not just about the transaction. Mm -hmm. It's about the development of the transaction. And the transaction starts even before anyone recognizes that it's a project. Mm -hmm. And and so so with that it was I was just convicted to lend assistance to that community right. to help strengthen development. Were were you involved at all with the Mount Pleasant uh, church development? Uh, I I was not, but I was involved with the New Psalmist and the New Shiloh development. Right. And those, uh, for those uh, people who don't know, those are very large churches? Yes, yeah. correct. And do they also have um, uh, any, like, housing or other uh, development activity associated with them? So... so <clears throat> So I'm just one of them, instead of calling a name, one of them Sorry. Has, <laughs> has been very um, aggressive in development. And just another story for you, um, Mayor Schmoke at the time was very helpful and um, getting one of the ministries into development. And when you're in Baltimore City, you hear a number of disappointing things, and so you'll hear about flight. Flight also brings opportunity. And so there was a company that um, all of us know about that was anxious to leave a community and offered their property to one of the ministries. And we encouraged the ministry to buy it and to develop it. And on the ministry campus, not only do they have individual housing, but they, they now have um, developed multifamily housing, um, bookstores, and other type of economic development initiatives. Mm -hmm. And I bring up Mayor Smoke because um, at a time when it was very crucial, the mayor did something that um, most mayors would not have done. And, it, and when, when, when you're in urban communities, you will hear about redlining, and no one believes that redlining goes on and just for everyone. Redlining is um, selective lending, and, and in certain communities, lending is not available. And I approached the mayor, um, and basically says, Mr. Mayor, you have an issue. You have an issue because in Baltimore City, there's redlining, and you cannot grow the city if that is allowed to continue. So the mayor brought um, hits of banks into his office, asked me to attend. And so can you just imagine presidents of banks sitting around the table saying, there's no redlining. How can you prove redlining? And so I gave them an example. And, and if I need to apologize in advance, I'm apologizing. So, so the mayor um, 
asked me to explain why I thought it was redlining. And I basically said, um, I have five clients in a city needing to expand, wanting to construct, cannot find financing. They're getting denied. There is another ministry who is not my client that called me to ask for recommendations to the bank, to a bank. We gave them a bank to call. They called the bank. The bank invited them in to the corporate dining room, gave them the money, and this client financially was worth less than the five that were denied. So when we said that to the banks, one of the bank presidents said, show me what you submitted. So we showed them what was submitted for one of the institutions. And the president came back and gave that institution more money than we had requested initially. So, so what that did was break the tie. I must say, however, that something like that is going on again. And, but it's going on in the appraisal area. And it's, it's something that from a institutional standpoint have to be addressed because what's going on in, in my opinion in Baltimore City is there is a push down of values and a push down of values will stifle expansion. It will force people to go to another community to expand it will sell property at a lower level, and then you have gentrification. Now, gentrification isn't a bad word, but if it's uncontrolled gentrification, it is bad for the city. And so it is something that um, um, must be taken on at, with a strong initiative. Right. And um, University of Baltimore would be a, a great institution <laughs> to look into it. It sounds like a neighborhood <laughs> indicator, Slim. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> so you, uh, it's interesting the amount of volunteer uh, time that you gave. I think that's probably one of the things you might recommend to young people coming out of, of uh, college and out of graduate programs? The greatest advice that I received in business life was um, from a gentleman who gave me one statement, and it was, the only way that you can make a difference is to be at the table. And I would just tell anyone coming out of school that you must be in a room to make change. And you don't just go in a room because it's a room. You have to be invited in. And to get invited in, you have to work. And, and, and the work, you start at a lower level. So I'm now at this point where I'm privileged to go into a room and don't have to do the lower level work, but there are no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. You don't go to um, a board where now you have staff that assist you in making the decisions. You have to work the board and working a board teaches you what the books are saying. And, and you don't get it without the work. 
And that is the most valuable lesson I learned in my entire career. Now, interested at a certain point, you uh, went on the board and then chaired the board of the Baltimore Development Corporation, which has a, a great deal of uh, involvement with real estate uh, development in our city. What were some of the challenges that you faced? And I'd be interested in projects that you, uh, I don't know, when you look back on uh, your tenure that you're most proud of. So, so from a BDC perspective, um, I'll give you two projects that I am most proud of. The, the first one is the um, Waterfront Marriott. And, and I never forget um, uh, being appointed chair of um, a BDC by the then uh, Mayor Martin O'Malley. I go to my first meeting and it's about um, uh, dollars needed to make the Marriott waterfront successful. And if anyone go to Inner Harbor East and see it now, you have to remember it prior to the waterfront Marriott. And, and it was my thought at the time that if we could make this project go, it would change that area of town. And it is, and it did exactly what it was supposed to do. The second project that I am most proud of is um, the Baltimore Hilton Hotel, which is known as the Convention Center Hotel. The reason that I'm most proud of um, the Hilton Hotel is for many years, Baltimore knew that it needed a convention hotel. The, the Baltimore the, uh, Waterfront Marriott was the first convention hotel. And, and so, so it did what it needed to do, but it was far from the convention center. So now there was interest of getting a, a headquarters hotel connected to the convention center. And Baltimore Development Corporation put out all of these RFPs and the um, capital markets were changing. No one wanted to take the risk. So Baltimore Development Corporation basically said, we could do this ourselves. And basically took on the development, the management, the construction, and the opening of that hotel. And I think that without that, what you're hearing about hotel occupancy, more hotels coming to the city of Baltimore, that would not have happened without uh, BDC um, taking the risk that that could work. Right. Now that was uh, at the time, uh, I, I recall just on that project, that's after me. So. Sure. Uh, but I was reading about it, and I know that there was a lot of political controversy. To what extent, how were you able to keep your development decisions, BDC's uh, real estate and development decisions, kind of uh, insulated from political uh, uh, interference? The, the, so as board chair, I have a, um, just a simple philosophy of staying focused, not letting um, reporters, news articles influence the decision. 
what should influence decisions would be sound advice. And, and BDC had a great board, board, but even better than a great board, BDC had great staff. And the keeping focus, um, was, we were able to achieve it. The, there were always newspaper articles about how bad the hotel was doing, but that was selling newspapers. Um, because we, because this should also be an educational session. Um, there is something in accounting called depreciation. And depreciation is paper. It basically means you're not spending dollars because you already spent it. Now you're systematically writing off the cost of your investment. So it looked like the hotel was losing money because of depreciation. But from a cash flow perspective, BDC never missed a payment, not to vendors, not to the capital markets. And so everyone wanted to know, well, why isn't BDC refinancing its mortgage, another lesson. In, in capital markets, there is something called arbitrage. Arbitrage is a tax rule. If you get um, tax financing, or if you get public financing, the government want to make certain that your debt stays in existence for a certain period. And if it doesn't, then it triggers arbitrage. Another word for arbitrage is penalty, recall, payback. So money that you already had benefit of, you would have to give it back. And so Baltimore City just waited until they could refinance, lower the debt, and now everybody is celebrating how well the hotel is doing. Well, you're triggering memories of my days as a bond lawyer, and I just went, <laughs> <laughs> so, hand sweating now, that's right. So the, the other uh, the political side, uh, uh, often BDC would get criticized uh, saying, you, you're focusing on the big developments. What about the little guys? What, what kind of projects for person in the neighborhoods where you uh, uh, financing? Okay. Um, okay. So um, I'm picking on someone, so, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, the, the church I attend is in um, um, Broadway East. Broadway East. Um, a project is going on. And, and there's also a project going on in Port Covington. Port Covington is in, on the water. Broadway East is in the urban community. Which one are you going to read about? You're going to read about Port Covington. So so the things that you were reading about dealing with what's downtown is because that's where the skyscrapers are. But, but it was just as much work going on in the community with various projects. And so you just don't get the, the, the coverage. This is the first year I can remember that neighborhoods are beginning to get the publicity that they deserve many years ago. But why are they getting the publicity? 
they're getting a publicity because of people like um, Bishop Dante Hickman, who invites the President of the United States to Baltimore City. So now all of a sudden, everybody is interested in urban communities be and learn that now it is great to invest in these communities. So, so um, is, is, is that also political? Mm -hmm. And I would dare say that it's bold politics to take an initiative, create funds like um, neighborhood impact investment funds, earmark them for urban communities, understanding if the urban communities lift, it lifts downtown. It doesn't, and if downtown lifts first, it does not necessarily lift those urban communities. So it's about time that leadership here has begun to focus not on um, developing a block, but developing a community. And if you develop a community, if you, if you develop one, somebody else will raise their hand and say, help me develop number two. And so we're now seeing um, a degree of excitement that we have not seen in, in, in Baltimore in some time. Forgetting what you read in the paper, not that what you read is um, fake news, but, but what, what you're reading also put the emphasis on what you're reading, but not what's happening on the ground. And what's happening on the ground is extremely important. And, and just um, an aside, just, just before we came into this room, you saw a number of um, sponsors around um, the other room that we were in the reception room. And I went, walked up to the table of Pipeline and Pipeline is a University of Baltimore mm -hmm. student initiative. Mm -hmm. And they had a computer, and I walked up and said, show me what's on your computer. And all of a sudden, they went to a screen that showed all of the projects that were going on in certain communities. <laughs> Well, if that was publicized, if that was the news, we would be beginning to bring other businesses outside of Baltimore into Baltimore because they're seeing that things are going on greater than the headlines. You speak with a great deal of optimism. Do you think the financial um, uh, sector in our community shares that uh, that optimism. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I I happened um, uh, a week ago to have a a, din a dinner with the president of the Richmond Federal Reserve. So for everybody, that's a big deal because it was the president of Richmond Federal Reserve. <laughs> and so, so the Federal Reserve um, set monetary policy. So it's supposed to be a dinner, but they're trying to suck information out of you. And, and so they asked the same question. So they evidently read President Smoke's um, note cards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so they wanted to know what's going on with the Baltimore optimism. And, and my response was, if you look at 18 
we entered 18 very optimistic. If you look at the start of 19, 19 is very cautious because people are beginning to look at the end of 19. Will there be a recession? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I shared with the Federal Reserve President that you, you often hear something that sounds corny. Um, there is a lack of capital in urban communities and the access to capital is not the same as it is in suburban communities. I said, so it sounds corny. We've been hearing it for a very long time, but it's extremely true. And begin to say that we can tell the financial institutions that are having issues with community reinvestment in the Community Reinvestment Act. For everybody, every large institution has a requirement to invest in communities. They get credit for doing that. But do they do that investment in the real communities of need and only when it's necessary? So I basically made that statement to the president of the Richmond Federal Reserve. And he said, we know that and we need to fix it because what we see is when it comes close to December, when it's time to send your report, you can find money because people want to report to the Federal Reserve that they are um, reinvesting into these communities. He says what the Federal Reserve need to do is not base it on the end of the year, but throughout the year. And, and we basically support that. As it relates to, um, to banks and financial institutions, our practice is with smaller and uh, m minority businesses as well as not-for-profit and um, entities. Our, our clients are all sizes. Um, as, as It could be as small as a corner store to as large as the National Football League. But the, the interesting part of that is that you get to see differences. So what we what we see with the larger institutions is they do not always understand uh, the needs of communities and how to address them. So you need the BDCs with loan funds. You need the neighborhood investment funds. You need the Mahifas, the Maryland, health and higher education facilities authorities, other facilities that begin to understand that they can provide a carrot to these larger institutions. And so I happen to, again, say that to the president of the Richmond Reserve and called the name. I said, so take this bank as an example. So, so after the meeting, I was asked, did you read the chairman of the reserves comments the day before our dinner? And I basically says, absolutely not. He says, the chairman of the Federal Reserve in his remarks mentioned the same bank. Hmm. So everybody go back 
and read <laughs> <laughs> the, re the Federal Reserve comments, you'll see the bike. Well, at the end of the meeting with the Federal Reserve Chair, um, President, he was thanking me for the conversation, but the reason he was thanking me was the touch points that others do not take time to share. So most people sitting with the president of the Federal Reserve and his economic advisor, his economist was at the dinner as well. Um, and you get a two-hour session, almost one-on-one, -on -one, and they're listening to you. Why should we talk about what's going on in Baltimore County? We should be talking about what's going on in Baltimore City. And they're reading the news. So, so they're talking about um, corruption and the impact. They're talking about optimism, but the main thing they're talking about is what do you need, we, the community, need from the Federal Reserve to make a difference in turning a city around? And my answer was, we need you to understand the city. It's not like the county. Baltimore, Maryland is not necessarily like every other state. And gave them an example of other Federal Reserves that are coming into Maryland trying to loan money. And so I just asked the question, why is it that you had Midwest Federal Reserves trying to loan money in Maryland. Why do you have California credit unions come into Maryland? Why isn't Maryland meeting that need? And, and the, the president basically took notes and basically said, thank you for the information because these are touch points that uh, we really have to take back to the full Federal Reserve. And I um, think it's important sounds, that we have those type of opportunities. Sounds like uh, you legend gave them a good lesson. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Listen, I, was, I had one more question, but I, I'm not sure in this context I was going to ask you um, if uh, I had a magic wand and I could... Um, uh, I gave you two choices of a job that would advance economic development in Baltimore City. Which would you choose, uh, being mayor or being the president of a bank? I would be the president of the bank. <laughs> <laughs> and I would give a loan to you. <laughs> to you. <laughs> Uh, any, I'll give you the last word. Any, <laughs> any, any further comment? Any advice uh, that you might want to impart as, as kind of the last word? I, I, I just believe one that um, everyone should understand the impact of a University of Baltimore, but also the impact of a room like this, very diverse including in age. And if we could take anything away from this room, it is that we all really need to share. And I have this um, phrase I use at my office, and it is knowledge transfer. Everything we do, we really need to share with someone else because there is uh, we, we could talk about anything, but if 
if the diversity of sharing is not done in a very um, deliberate, strategic manner, we'll really miss it all. And in my opinion, um, Baltimore has um, great, a great future if the people in this room really um, work together to elevate it to its fullest potential. Please join me in thanking Arnold Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you can sit down. You're good. Okay. You're good. So I'd now like to ask uh, Bishop Dante Hickman to come up to the stage. Uh, B Bishop Hickman is a Baltimore native who has, uh, in October 2002, became the fourth pastor of the Southern Baptist Church in East Baltimore. You heard me mention in my opening remarks the Southern Streams Health and Wellness Center. With the mantra of restoring people as we re rebuild properties, Bishop Hickman is leading the East Baltimore Revitalization Project with the development of affordable housing, mixed-use properties, and community health services that will transform more than 100 acres just north of the Hopkins Medical Campus. It is exactly the kind of neighborhood development that Arnold spoke of, that I know President Schmoke supports throughout, and that is the Benia um, stuff that Seema is talking about. So, Bishop Pickman, if you could say a couple of words to, to your parishioner and consigliere. <laughs> I didn't want him to practice a lot. Well, <laughs> <not a license. laughs> consigliere is a uh, counselor to a crime boss, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not no Michael Corleone, but <laughs> the, uh, the question has... Uh, to be asked, how do you pastor um, such brilliance <laughs> and such a genius? Uh, who can pastor this type and this kind of member? And uh, I, the greatest way to pastor them is to make them your advisor and your pastor. <laughs> and uh, that's what Arnold has been to me for more than uh, 20 years now. I've known, uh, had the privilege of knowing him uh, before I began pastoring, and when I took on my first pastorate in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, when they asked me, what do you want your compensation to be, uh, I did what most preachers uh, who have any sense do, call Arnold Williams. <laughs> Arnold is known for coming in to negotiate your compensation package and any new pastor uh, I talked to, he said, Doc, yeah, what should I ask for? And I said, did you talk to Arnold? He said, no. I said, well, then you lost. It's a lost <laughs> cause. <laughs> Wait for the next church. And um, I, I found out that preachers can make parishioners say amen in the sanctuary, but Arnold can make them say amen in the boardroom. <laughs> um, he has an uncanny way of speaking uh, the language that bankers uh, finance persons and trustees can understand. And if they don't understand, uh, Arnold will talk slow enough <laughs> and long enough that they will act like they understand <laughs> and, and just go along with him. Um, I believe that there are at least three things that make him so successful. And these are three things that I've I've never seen since knowing Arnold. Uh, Arnold is never without a solution or a way to get there. Mm. Just when you run into a brick wall, Arnold finds a way to go around, to dig under, to go up, or to wait patiently until that wall comes down. Jo Josh has uh, just come around us in the last year and he's somewhat of a black hat, yellow hat thinker. He, he thinks he's a green hat thinker, but he's always throwing caution and this will never work. And uh, just causes you to be real depressed sometimes. But, but no, I love Josh. <laughs> but, but Arnold always uh, keeps us optimistic and finds 
uh, ways to get important things accomplished. Uh, the, the second thing I believe with, that makes Arnold so successful and that I've never seen is Arnold never loses his cool. <laughs> he never goes off. He always maintains his soft-spokenness. And I have tried <laughs> to annoy him, <laughs> to get under his skin, to get him to see things my way. But one thing you never want to see Arnold do, and this is the closest he'll get to losing his cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then you know it's over. <laughs> Third thing that makes him so successful that I've never seen is I've never seen his cell phone number. Um, nobody has Arnold's cell phone number. Um, you have to call his office or you have to email That's him. Funny. The only person that has his cell phone number is his wife. Right. And then when I call the house, she doesn't even answer <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, 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 to Arnold. Uh, he never gives his cell phone number, and you just have to wait for his call. And when he calls you back, he has a nerve to call you from a private number. <laughs> it's blocked, so you have to answer the call. It keeps him stress-free. Uh, and uh, in control. I trust Arnold to help me uh, with the heavy lifts and to develop and deepen uh, the emotional intelligence that I sometimes scarcely have. Arnold, in closing, is, a, uh, is very multifaceted and cannot be boxed in. He's not only a great accountant, but if you're going to court, you need him and your lawyer. If you're doing real estate development, you need your realtor or developer and Arnold. And if you're undergoing heart surgery, I dare say you want Arnold in the surgical <laughs> procedure. I was almost stumped when I first came in today because Arnold acts in some ways like a mental health therapist uh, to his pastor. And I came in the room and his wife, Virgie, introduced me to a young man. She said, this is Chad. This is Arnold's therapist. And I said, oh my God, Arnold has a therapist? And I'm immediately saying, I'm about to fire him and hire this guy. <laughs> and as we're standing there, I can't wait to go home and say, oh my God, Arnold has a therapist. And uh, one of his friends, best friends walks up, Fred, and Fred said, oh, you know, this is our therapist. I said, wow, these guys are tossing around very freely <laughs> that they have this mental health therapist. So I, I, I quickly said, Fred, is it mental health? He said, no, physical health. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Arnold will remain my mental health therapist. <laughs> Arnold is a genius whose mind continues to not only fascinate me, but stretches my own thinking and capacity. I always try to capture and harness as much of his brilliance as I can. And I ask Arnold all the time, his approach to thinking, how is he able to think these things through and see all of the angles? And, uh, and he never gives me his secret sauce. <laughs> the best way that I think that we can all emulate uh, his thinking is to strive after his tremendous heart to do that which is right, his unparalleled humility, and his indefatigable hope in all things. I am so proud to be his pastor and to have him as my friend, Arnold Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In, in Baltimore tonight, uh, honestly, Bishop Hickman, Arnold Williams, President Schmoke, we could not have asked for a better evening. Thank you all very much for being here today, and congratulations Thank to you. Thank you. Here you are. Oh. <laughs> this is serious it. stuff it, there. It really is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good. Oh, it's it. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hope, hope it's what you wanted. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Seema, do you want us to keep that out of the box? Okay. Um, 
Let me have the uh, mic. I'll just take it back. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. <laughs> Super. Good, good deal. Were you happy? All right. Good seeing you, President Smoke. Thank you.